Welcome back to the Vandy Sports Podcast. I'm Billy Derrick, and I've got a special guest today. But first, let's get to the Wash House. It's not technically basketball season, but Vanderbilt has a new basketball coach, and the Wash House is our presenting sponsor for basketball season. Are you dreading laundry day? Is it ceiling time to do the things that you truly enjoy? Let the laundry professionals at the Wash House take care of that for you. They've got two convenient locations in the Nashville area. Within 24 hours, you can pick up your nicely folded, fresh and clean laundry ready to be put away. Log on to washhouseclean.com or stop in today and get your time back. Mark Byington is the new Vanderbilt men's basketball coach. Introductory press conference, of course, will be Thursday of this week. I'm joined by Bennett Conlon, the co-founder of JMU Sports News. Of course, been covering Mark uh, Byington's tenure there uh, up in Virginia. Bennett, thanks for taking the time. I appreciate it. Um, let's start with the beginning of, of Mark Byington getting to uh, Virginia, of course. And I made sure to ask you, you've been there the whole time and covering them uh, while byington has been there. What was the initial reaction when the hire was made official uh, to bring in Coach Byington? And what were kind of the early stages like of him him getting uh, acquainted with, with the town, the culture, the, the community? And uh, because it did seem like he built up the program pretty quickly. He did. Yeah, it was a, a muted response uh, when he took the job. He did it like really early in the pandemic. So yeah. they they moved on from the last basketball coach in March of 2020. Mark Byington was hired. I think his like announcement that he was joining the program was him like at his house or something via just like a cell phone video that he was holding up. It was super uh, weird and put together, but when he got to Harrisonburg, he started working quickly on uh, the players that they had on the roster, making sure that they played in a system that fit them, put them in positions to succeed. And then I think maybe most importantly, it's a program that hadn't really won anything of note in two or three decades at least. So building a culture where the players, the support personnel, all the coaches, everybody expected to win basketball games was a pretty significant change. And he brought that right away, he sort of understood what the expectations were. Uh, he got the fan base engaged even in the first year where I think there were still COVID limits, right? So you could only have like a thousand fans uh, in Virginia. It might have even been less than a thousand that could go to the games. So nobody really at the games that first season, but he still got the fan base engaged, which I thought was, was really impressive. And then obviously built from there, they had a new arena that opened his first year, but didn't have full attendance. So super disjointed and weird. And I thought he managed that incredibly well. Let's get into, you know, your impressions of him, um, because like you, like I said earlier, you've covered him uh, throughout his entire tenure. That, that first year was kind of a wash. I mean, I mean, it looks like they finished 13 and seven uh, in that COVID season. Uh, but again, that, it's sort of a wash for everybody. Uh, so honestly, year one, I would almost call that that next season, technically year you know, two for him, I guess, uh, still in the, the CEA, CAA, of course, 15 and 14, probably still getting acquainted with um, you know, the conference and, and the players he has. But I noticed 2022, 23, 22 and 11 in the first year in the Sun Belt. Early on, what, what did you know that, OK, Coach Byington is going to succeed here? Um, and was it early on when you knew, OK, you know, this guy, I, I think he's headed in the right direction. Or was it a little bit later, maybe in 2022, 23, when you kind of realized, OK, I think this guy has this this program headed in the right direction? I think every time somebody hires a new coach, at least for me, the first thing I do is I like get to the Wikipedia page and look at all the records. And I think for Byington, his first two years in Harrisonburg, I don't think like the Wikipedia record does him justice. So that first year when they're 13 and seven, uh, actually finished first place in the regular season in the CA that year. So they were the best team in the conference. Matt Lewis is probably the best player in the conference. Suffers an injury in one of the last games of the year. They don't have him for the conference tournament. So they go out in the conference tournament pretty quickly because of his injury. But they improved so much that year. They went from basically the worst team in the conference to the best within a year with the same roster because it was before the uh, – like the transfer portal rules where you can kind of go anywhere, whenever you want now. Um, not quite like that at the beginning of his tenure. So he took them um, that first year and made him immediately competitive, um, which I thought was really impressive because it was the same guys, all the Jamie fans thought, Hey, 
it's a talented roster. Why are they nine and 21 and sub 300 on Ken Palm? Byington arrives and it's like, yes, that's sort of what everybody expected a competent group. So we got them going immediately, which is nice. That second year, I think they started nine and two uh, with wins over like George Mason, ODU, and Virginia in those nine. They were playing really well. Um, they ended up switching conferences, I guess, October of that year. And it came out that the CAA was going to ban. JMU from playing in the postseason. So they weren't allowed to play in the conference tournament. So the second half of that year, the motivation for the team was was pretty low because you can't even play in your conference tournament. You can't make the bid dance. So they kind of just, I would say, um, slid down the rest of that season, struggled a good bit. But they were pretty good at the start of that season. So those first two years, they were actually pretty solid. His third year, they were solid again. And then he made some great additions via the portal had some great player development in this final year, right? And they won 32 games. They were awesome. But early on, he had them going in the right direction. It was just sort of a matter of getting everything to fall into place. One of those things being in the conference, letting you play in the conference tournament. Uh, COVID sort of getting out of the way was huge. And once he got those things, you could have fans in the stands. He had a roster that he liked. Uh, he was able to develop some players, go in the portal. He made them one of the better mid-majors in the country. So yeah, he was really, really good from day one. And then obviously at the end of his tenure, they're playing their best basketball. I've done a little research uh, on, on his offensive playing style. And, and obviously you hear the word, hear words like up tempo and, um, you know, three point shooting. Uh, but, but having players and getting players in his program that, that can shoot threes, that can shoot and make threes, as opposed to just, you know, having everybody shoot. And also I've heard phrases like positionless basketball, where you have a, you know, you have a your three man bringing it up sometimes, and maybe even you know the four, the five occasionally, and just watching JMU, especially this past season, um, you know, you would see almost every clip, every possession, you know, especially off of a rebound, usually not on an inbound, but off a rebound, whoever grabs it is is bringing it up the floor. I mean, that's what it felt like. So, how would you describe his offensive style? Uh, I know it's kind of hard sometimes to describe offensive styles, especially. Uh, when it, you're in today's day and age and, and you're, you're switching things a lot and, and it's sometimes it's hard for coaches to stay consistent. But with Byington, how would you describe his offensive play style? Because I think that's one thing that uh, that Vanderbilt fans are, are kind of intrigued about him. Yeah, I think it's a great one if you're a fan. I also think it's kind of a great one if you're a player. So they're, they're very free and flowing. So like you mentioned, uh, they love to sort of change who's bringing the ball up. There were times this year that TJ Bickerstaff, the center for the team would get a rebound and drive all the way to the rim and score. Uh, I think if, if you're a fan, right, I think there's some old school JMU fans who saw that and are like pulling their hair out until he scored. Uh, but when he did, you're like, Oh, that's, that's kind of fun. Like, that's interesting. Certainly not every possession, right? There are times where Bickerstaff or whoever gets the rebound, kicks it to a guard quickly and they, they move it up. But yeah, if there's a missed shot on that end or a turnover sort of, um, a focal point of the defense too. their, their goal is to run. They want to run. They want to get out because they think they can get the defense, um, I guess, out of position, right? They're not in a, a great spot. You have the advantage over them in transition. They do a great job with it. Multiple guys can take it up. They do multiple sets sort of out of things in transition to get guys open. They'll have players attack the rim. And the idea with attacking the rim is certainly you could get the layup and score, but also you could draw the defense in, kick it out for a three, which they did a great job of knocking down transition threes this year. So they're really fun to watch. Yeah, getting the, the good three-point shooters is important. There were some times earlier in his tenure where they had some guys who were inconsistent from three, so they were maybe a little better at getting to the rim in transition. Uh, some of the shots they took from three would would maybe go cold for spells, but the defense kept him in a lot of games uh, last season prior to the 32-win year. So they, they play good defense, try to create a lot of steals, offensively very free flowing. And then I think from just, uh, I guess a pure coaching philosophy, Byington is very calm with players. So you see some coaches where a player makes a mistake and they're chewing them out or screaming at them or whatever. Byington doesn't do that. He lets them play freely. And part of that is he gives them a lot of leeway. So if they're going to make a mistake or two, he gets that they try to correct it, but he's pretty calm about that, which I think gives the players a ton of confidence. You can sort of see that grow throughout a season. So a Byington team, at least typically, the way they play in November, 
they've been good in November, but the way they play in March is a lot different. They make strides throughout the season. They gain a lot more confidence. Players develop year to year if he keeps them in the program, which is a big thing. Terrence Edwards, who um, maybe he ends up at Vanderbilt next year. He was um, he was an okay player as a freshman, but he was really raw. And then he was the conference player of the year in the Sun Belt this past year. Completely overhauled his entire game. He got better at just about everything. I think Byington played a huge role in that. So he lets guys make mistakes. He lets them play a system that's a lot of fun. He helps them develop over time. And he's a really, really quality coach in that way. So offensively, you know, we know their, their style offensively, but it, but I think people forget about this system is that the, the defense is just important. The, the defense leads uh, to these offensive breaks and, and, and that up-tempo style of play. They were top 70 in Ken Palm adjusted offensive and defensive efficiency, which I thought was interesting, which, you know, doesn't blow the roof off people, but being top 70 in both, um, I, I think stands out. So defensively, give me the lowdown defensively, because I did notice uh, in this YouTube video, I watched that they have active hands. They're, they're good about avoiding fouls uh, where, you know, their guys are taught to, it looks like just go straight up and, um, you know, no slapping. And, and if you have a chance to contest, you know, just go straight up and, and avoid the foul and, and just a lot of deflections. And I heard somebody else talking about his style saying they definitely chart deflections. And, and I think that's a sign of a good coach as well, because oftentimes deflections lead to steals. So how does the defense play into the offense in Byington's style uh, while he was at JMU and, and what you were able to see? Yeah, it's all connected, which I think is you'll see some coaches, right, that don't have that where maybe the, the offense is doing something and it doesn't seem to relate to the defense and you just get this really clunky product from a viewing perspective and then the results don't really follow. Byington does a great job of having it all connected. So he wants to run and the easiest way to run, right, is a missed shot or a steal. If you can force a turnover, it becomes a lot easier to run in transition. So they're extremely active in the passing lanes. They they get into defenders. They defend the three-point line very aggressively. They never really seem out of control on that. So they defend the three well, create a lot of turnovers, which is a pretty nice defensive recipe for success. And yeah, you mentioned top 70 in Ken Palm. Maybe not crazy nationally, but I think doing that at JMU is a, a pretty huge deal. And I know fans were stoked that they were good on both ends this year and certainly the best team uh, in recent memory for JMU and maybe even program history. They did a lot of a lot of great things, but it starts with the defensive end. And I think a lot of that too is roster makeup. So he's not going to get like a Zach Eady type who slows you down and you can't really run and, and things like that. He likes guys who are long, athletic, can play multiple positions. And some of that applies to offense, certainly, but a lot of that applies to defense where he's comfortable having his center, at least he was at JMU, switch onto a guy's point guard and, and defend for a possession. There were times this year where they would switch, right? And they get Bickerstaff, who's a 6'9 center, on a point guard, the point guard would drive to the rim and Bickerstaff would end up blocking the shot at the rim. And it was something where it was like the other team thought they had this great advantage. And in reality, Byington was extremely comfortable with them taking that matchup because he liked his guy, he could trust his guy to defend. So yeah, they're athletic at, at pretty much every position. And that's, that's sort of how he builds his roster. Byington, the, the coach, we, we know about his style, but I, I want to get into a little bit of the the person that, that Coach Byington is. And um, obviously with you covering the program, I would assume you've had the chance to meet him and interact with him and, and, and you know, maybe even some of his assistants and um, just how he carries himself. How would you describe his personality and, and sort of how uh, he connects with the community? Because it really felt like he did that um, at JMU, whether it was with the students or alums or just local fans or former players like how is coach Byington the person off the court and, and how does that uh, help his program or how did it help his program succeed uh, at JMU yeah I think he's really even keeled and, and positive kind of all the time and you could see that in the community you could see that right in press conferences he did interactions with him just really positive really even keeled um, and there are some coaches I think that that are like that off the court and they get on the court and then they're like insane, right? You get a couple of calls that go against you and they lose their mind. I don't know if he got a tech. I don't think he got a tech during his time in Harrisonburg. If he did, it was maybe one minor one at some point, but uh, some players probably did when he was here, but I don't think, uh, I don't think Mark did himself. So he did a really good job of staying even keeled, staying calm. And he's like that off the court. He's, he's engaging and, um, 
certainly some times where I think as fans, maybe you wish you would say a little more about the roster, give you a little more insight here or there. But uh, if you get the right questions, they'll certainly go into what his team needs to do. And he's honest about stuff. If his guys aren't playing well or they aren't doing something defensively, he'll he'll say that, say they need to get better and they work on it and improve throughout the season. So I thought he was honest and really even keeled. He's maybe not going to give you a ton of flashy quotes, but he's he just is who he is and sort of sticks to that on and off the court. All right, I want to get into this past season. A conference tournament champion, uh, appeared in the NCAA tournament, was ranked in the top 20, I want to say, at, at one point this past season. Just incredible year that, you know, I don't know that many people around the country saw coming, but I'm sure a lot of people within the program thought this could be a really good JMU team and in a pretty solid Sun Belt. I mean, 32-4 and four in the regular season, knock off Wisconsin, of course, uh, lose a tough one to Duke, but no shame in that. Um, tell me about how that happened because year three, 22 and 11, right? You're building up, uh, but did you expect this type of year under Byington? And how did how was he able to form a, a team at James Madison that was this good, this fun to watch, and a team that ended up being able to pull off an upset in the NCAA tournament? They had probably two or three key players the year prior that were that were good players, but I would say they were inefficient scorers. So they could defend, they could go off. Like they had a few guys who could get you 25 or 30 if they were hot, but there were some nights when they weren't hot um, and they would still probably shoot the ball 15 or 20 times. Those players graduated. He replaced them, I think, with guys in the portal who were more efficient they also struggled to defend the two-point shot. They got way bigger in the portal. And then with a, a high school recruiter, true freshman, Jalen Carey, uh, who's in the portal now, um, who 6'8", 245, could hold his own defending the two-point shot. So they're really good against the three, but they also got a lot better from two. They got more efficient, I think, because of the roster changes. So going in, there was definitely a lot of optimism that could sort of click. And then I think Byington just does a good job of getting guys to buy into the team, getting in the idea that, hey, we have a lot of guys who can score. We're going to go close to 10 deep. You're going to play. You're going to have chances to score. It might not be on a nightly basis. Like you might not have a great Thursday game, but then we're going to play on Saturday. And depending on who we match up with, you might be the guy who goes and gets 20. They seem to really embrace that. So you had a lot of different guys who could step up. They built around Terrence Edwards, who was the conference player of the year. And then they also got him to buy in the idea of, of, like you're the guy, but you also need to distribute the ball, and that can be part of being the guy. I think they might have went undefeated, or at least they were until late in the year when he had at least five assists, which is a stat that he loved, and I think that they were probably plugging to him. I think that's like, hey, we don't lose if you get five assists. And you could tell that a few times after they said that, he made a huge effort to get five assists, and you'd watch him in the game making extra passes and getting more guys involved and they were really unselfish about it. So I think that helped. And it was just, I think it was a masterful job in the portal to find guys who are capable of playing for you that maybe weren't getting high end power five offers to get them on your roster and form a team that was good enough to beat a couple of big 10 squads, have it all click. So he did a great job. I think in the portal high school recruiting and then developing the players that stay with him is, is really a trademark of, of his program. A big part of of building a program and, and and building a program that goes thirty two and four is using the portal, and a big part of using the portal is nil. Um, you know, it's interesting. I think people would be surprised around the country uh, ab about JMU's um, collective. I, I've heard good things about it, and that they they really held their own and and could honestly probably compete with some lower level um, power five schools that that maybe you know um, are lacking because I mean there's schools of course in the SEC that um, Vanderbilt maybe can't have their hold their own, own against, but Byington and his eye for talent will be intriguing uh, to see, okay, he may not be able to get the kid that everybody wants, but maybe he finds that diamond in the rough while still being able to pay him something. Um, and you would guess that, that he was able to do that at least somewhat at JMU. How was the collective at JMU? Was it utilized? Was it, um, was it invested in? Was it something that Byington valued? And how do you maybe see him doing that at a school like Vanderbilt? I'm not, I'm not sure how familiar you are with, with the Vanderbilt landscape, but the collective has improved and they feel like they have the resources. So how was the collective utilized by Byington at, at, at JMU? And, 
Um, and and do you think those skills could potentially transfer over to an SEC school like Vanderbilt? Yeah, I think they definitely could. So the JMU Collective is is still growing. It's relatively new and reasonably small, but they've got some some funds coming in. I think probably mostly football, which makes sense for pretty much every collective. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they've got some men's basketball funds. I don't know the exact amount that they've they've got, but like Terrence Edwards got paid this year. I don't know exactly what he was paid, but the way JMU does it, or at least the way they they say they're currently doing it, um, is the collective which I guess is technically right not affiliated with the university, but they'll have athletes and they'll partner with like a local charity and they'll do some, some mm-hmm. community service. That's part of their stipend then. Um, and they, they focus on not bringing guys um, in from the portal with NIL money. So it was basically like retaining players. Retention was really the focus. Mm-hmm. So Terrence Edwards was a guy they were hoping to retain. Um, some others might've been considered. I know football definitely worked to retain some players. So the guys who came in, via the portal were pretty much there because they wanted to play for Byington. and they thought the team had a chance to be really good. So um, yeah, if you, you have a little more NIL opportunity at Vanderbilt, which certainly there is, I think that's exciting for Byington and gives him a great opportunity. And, you know, I love Harrisonburg, Virginia. I spent a, a bunch of years there, right? Great spot. It's not Nashville. So <laughs> when you're coaching in Nashville, you've got an SEC program, you run a really fun offense it's connected to the defense. You develop players and have a track record of players getting a lot better if they stay with you for multiple seasons. It seems like a pretty easy pitch to get really high quality players that can compete in the SEC, at least in my eyes. All right. I want to keep this going a little bit. Um, how do you see the overall fit? Right. I, I looked at this initially. Um, and, you know, we were kind of tracking guys like Chris Mack, who, of course, was at Xavier, Louisville who's been out of coaching. Um, that didn't happen. We were kind of then tracking Danny Sprinkle, who ended up taking the Washington job from Utah State. And then kind of out of nowhere, here comes Mark Byington, uh, his name, um, of course, through the message boards and, and through the ether. And we started we started researching him. And I think initially it was just, okay, who is this guy? And then we really looked into uh, who he was as a coach, and, and a person and and all of his experience. He's been at Georgia Southern College of Charleston and, and really rave reviews from a lot of national pundits. How do you see him potentially working and fitting at Vanderbilt? I know you got into it a little bit there. Mm-hmm. What's the what's the feel around JMU? Like are people saying, man, like we we lost him. He's he's going to Nashville. Think he's gonna do well. Because I've also heard this is a little bit of a lateral move, potentially. Um, I'm not saying I agree with that. I've, I've heard that. Um, so what do you think? What do you think about the overall fit and, and what he could potentially do? <laughs> JMU fans, man, they've got some, <laughs> they've got some, I guess, high, <laughs> high self-confidence with, with the lateral move. Comments. Well, not, not necessarily JMU fans. Maybe I've, I've heard it from maybe a few JMU fans on Twitter, but, I, but it was probably just random people on people Twitter. Throwing saying, it oh, out feel, there. Yeah. It feels like a lateral move, but yeah. I think with, with Byington is, I think, and I think you guys might've mentioned this on a podcast I was listening to, but he's very calculated with what he does. So the players he brings in the portal are very calculated. He's not just trying to grab random players. He thinks are athletes. He he makes Mm -hmm. sure it's a good fit. He wouldn't have left this JMU job if he didn't think the Vanderbilt job was a good fit for him. So I think in a couple of ways, right? 32 wins at JMU kind of hard to top that. So maybe you strike while the iron's hot in some regards, get yourself to a power five spot. Uh, the SEC is obviously a great conference to be in. So that makes a lot of sense. I think he believes he can win there, take them to NCAA tournaments and have success at that spot. And I think the other thing too, he's not like a sexy name, right? If you're a Vanderbilt fan, you're looking at like Chris Mack, a name that, you know, you probably don't know who Mark Byington is. So that makes a lot of sense. The JMU job. I mean, they didn't win an NCAA tournament game for four decades. And he was able to get him an NCAA tournament win playing really, really fun basketball to watch. He's sort of a dream for the kind of coach you're looking for. I think the other thing too, is it's easy when you jump on Ken Palm, you look at all the JMU teams, you start analyzing those. If you look at Georgia Southern with Mark Byington and Georgia Southern without Mark Byington, Mm -hmm. there's a huge difference there. They weren't making NCAA tournaments, but they were winning 20 plus games for a program that's just been awful. And they're awful now. They were awful this year without Mark Byington. 
So it's been a few years and they're one of the worst teams in the Sun Belt. I guess they finished in the middle of the pack in the Sun Belt this year, but they went 0-13 out of conference, which isn't really a, a great mark for the Sun Belt when they win nine conference games. But um, I think if you're Mark Byington, right, SEC makes a ton of sense. You've built programs up. Vanderbilt, in a sense, you're, you are building up. But the resources there are more than anything you've ever had as a head coach. You know what it takes to win. I mean, he built a, a team, right, JMU, that's right around the top 60 in Ken Palm. You don't need to get a whole lot better than that to be competitive in the middle of the pack in the SEC. So I think he's excited about what he can do there with some some more NIL money playing in the SEC, the chance to maybe get some more NBA caliber players. I think they'll be pretty good under him. All right, last thing here. I've heard a lot of Nate Oates comparisons. Um, you know, Nate Oates obviously was at Buffalo, went over to Alabama, high powered offense, maybe not uh, a defense comparable to what uh, to what Coach Byington would want. Uh, but up tempo, you know, get up threes, get out and run. Um, and it almost feels like his style is what a lot of people are doing around the country. Uh, but, it, it, you know, you look at it and you go, OK, Byington really values defense. And, and creating that offensive break through the defense. Uh, if you were to look at him and go, hmm, I think of this coach when I think of Mark Byington, like, are there any comparisons you could draw? Do you like the Nate Oates comparison? Do you like another guy? Like, who would you maybe compare him to, uh, whether it's a coach that's older, an NBA coach, uh, you know, a, a retired coach? Like, how how would you look at him and, and uh, maybe compare him to other coaches? Yeah, I think that's fair, especially in terms of, of tempo they love to go go fast i think he's he's maybe a little bit more um i guess understated than than nate outs um mm -hmm. in some ways in terms of his personality he almost um in some ways a little bit different certainly but i guess some of the coaches that love to go fast where you got a mark few or tommy and lloyd sort of gonzaga with they love to go fast they love to be efficient but they also play great defense he hasn't achieved quite that success but he likes to go fast maybe not quite as fast as as some of those teams go, but he goes pretty quickly. He likes an offense that goes quickly. He likes a defense that's connected to the offense. I just think he's a really quality coach and I think he'll fit in nicely in the sec. He's also highly competitive, right? I talk about how he's even keeled and all that stuff. He likes to compete and he's not scared of playing good teams. And he was saying that at, at JMU, right? He was talking about Wisconsin and playing that game and how they hadn't been in the tournament in a decade or whatever. And he's like, you know, we didn't come here to, to be tourists is what he said. He came to, you know, we came to Brooklyn to win basketball games and the players buy into that. So I think that's part of it too, right? When you're getting guys at Vanderbilt and you're playing at Kentucky or you're playing NATO, it's at Alabama and you're going on the road, Byington's not going to go in there and be like, Oh man, this is hostile environment. This is terrifying. He's gonna be like, this is fun. This is an opportunity. This is why you came to Vanderbilt. This is going to be fun. We're going to go out and play our game. And we're, we're good enough to beat them. And I think over time, the program, the players in the program really start to believe that. And, and JMU players were able to believe that toward the end and beat some Power 5 teams. So I think he's going to be exciting. I know he's not a, a name hire necessarily for Vanderbilt, but the, what he did at JMU and how he took them from being sub-300 in Ken Palm that last year before he was there, I mean, they were incompetent. You watch them play basketball and you, you basically had to turn the TV off. It was really, really bad, even with some talented mid-major players, his first year, they were competent. So I think Vanderbilt, I know, right, I'm sure there's probably the idea, like, you got to give it a few years. I'm sure he'll probably say that to give himself maybe a buffer in the media or whatever. I think if you're a Vanderbilt fan, based on what you can do in the portal, I kind of expect Vanderbilt to be competitive and scrappy and fight for an NCAA tournament berth in year one. I think he's that good a coach, and I think the way you can turn over a roster, especially when you've got – for Jane, you guys who are pretty darn good players in the portal um, right now, it becomes interesting if you're a Vanderbilt fan, certainly. Yeah, it's interesting you talk about how how incompetent JMU was right before he got there. Same situation at Vanderbilt, maybe worse. I don't know how bad JMU was that the year before he got there, but I mean, historically bad year for Vanderbilt. Um, you know, losing to Presbyterian and um, you know San Francisco teams like that, where they just got embarrassed on their home floor. So I think fans are excited. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to come on and, um, we'll, we'll have some fun. Uh, hopefully, um, you know, we're, we're able to see what Byington did at JMU over here in Nashville at Vanderbilt. We'll see Bennett. Thanks for taking the time, man. And, uh, 
maybe uh, maybe you'll get Vanny fans excited after uh, after what you said about Coach Bollington. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me on.